Hello once again, everyone, and welcome to the Generations Bible Study, coming to you from Louisville, Kentucky, and the St. Stephen Church. My name's Ken Jobst, and we're continuing our ongoing study of the Gospel of John. This week, we come to a passage in John chapter 12, and we're going to look at verses 37 through 50. Now, as we come to this passage, we're coming to the conclusion of Jesus' public ministry. So, let's dive right in. John chapter 12, verses 37 through 50. You can follow along in your own Bible, or if you have message notes, that'll be great. From verse 37. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah, the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe, because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this, because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than the praise from God. Now, let's pause right here in these verses, and let's, um, we have to remember and, and keep, keep the proper context here for this particular passage. We need to recall that Jesus' public ministry, his public teaching, his public preaching, his public healing, all of that, by the time we come to this, these verses, chapter 12, verse 37 and following, all of that is now complete, and John takes a little moment here at the completion of Jesus' public ministry. John reflects on the rejection that Jesus has met, and think about this. Put yourself in this situation. Remember, at this point, all of Jesus' disciples are Jewish. And the central question still exists in the heart of the disciples, and it, it's a question that goes like this. Why, after all these signs, are there so many people who do not believe in Jesus? After, after all these signs, how is it that there can still be so many people who don't believe in Jesus. And, and by the way, recognize, chronologically, we're less than a week away from Calvary. Now, of course, John is writing this uh, in, in probably 90 or 95 AD. So John is looking back at these events over what could be a span of like half a century. And these questions certainly would have come up. How could it be that the Jews were missing the Messiah? And so close to Calvary was Jesus' mission shaping up to be a failure. Now, that, that's, that's an important question. Could it be that like Jesus was facing credibility issues at this juncture? Like if you're really the Messiah, uh, then, you know, but become the leader. If you're really the Messiah, overthrow the Romans. If you're really the Messiah, lead this messianic army now. Now, in last week's lesson, when we took a look in chapter 12, verses 1 through 36, we saw that in verse 34, the people had questions. 
And there were some people who were rejecting Jesus by saying, the Messiah is supposed to remain forever. So how can Jesus talk about being lifted up? If that lifted up means crucifixion, crucifixion means death. What are we going to do with a dead Messiah? Right? So, the major question is, with less than a week of his earthly ministry to go, is Jesus' mission falling apart here? It, it looks like the wheels are about to fall off. Why are not more Jewish people accepting Jesus as the Messiah? Remember, that he's entered into Jerusalem riding on the colt of a donkey. He's made these gestures of messiahship. He's, he's said some things and will say some things in this lesson as well that should uh, certainly confirm his status. Well, let me say this. Our lesson for today, this may be the takeaway from the, for the lesson today. The lesson for today may be this, that at some point, Jesus may not fit into all your expectations. There may be a point at which some of us believe that, you know what, if I accepted Jesus as Messiah, if I accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, then nothing bad is ever going to happen to me. Or my expectation might be, if I follow Jesus, I'll never get sick. Or my further expectation might be, if, if I believe in Jesus, and that's the roadmap to eternal life, then I should have an easy life because I'm doing things Jesus' way. Well, you know what? There may well come a time when Jesus does not fit our expectations. And so that's why John is addressing this problem of why some people believe and some people don't at this juncture. Why isn't that everybody just didn't drop what they were doing and say, okay, we're going to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior? John's going to address this question in a few verses here in chapter 12, at the close of chapter 12. The Apostle Paul addresses the same issue the same issue, and it's, it's, we could put it this way. We could call it the mystery of unbelief. Why do certain people not believe? And specifically, as John is addressing it here, and as the Apostle Paul addresses it in the letter to the Romans, chapters 9, 10, and 11, Paul specifically is addressing why, why did not the Jews believe? Why were there so many Jews that did not follow Jesus as the Messiah? They were biblically literate. They were engaged in, the, in worship, you know, on a regular basis. For all of these things they had going for them, still, they did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Well, John's going to, John's going to address this issue. And he does so by quoting the prophet Isaiah. Now, you know that in, uh, in the Bible, we've got different collections. You, you, first of all, you know the Bible is a library, right? The Bible's not simply a book. The Bible is a library of 66 books. There are 39 Old Testament books. There are 27 New Testament books. In the New Testament, we have Gospels, we have a little bit of history there with the, the, the book of Acts. We have letters, uh, the, the epistolatory tradition. And, and we have uh, the, the book of Revelation, which is an apocalypse. So we have a whole bunch of different types of literature in the New Testament. Likewise, we have a collection of different types of literature in the Old Testament. We have the Torah which is the law. We have the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. 
that forms what's called the Pentateuch, or the Torah. But we also have in the Old Testament a collection of historical books, tells us the history of Israel. We have a, a collection of wisdom literature. We also have a collection of prophetic literature. You know the prophets in the Old Testament are divided into the major prophets and the minor prophets. And first among the major prophets is the major prophet of Isaiah. Now, they're major or minor prophets simply based on the length of their prophecies. But Isaiah comes first in the prophetic books. Isaiah, interestingly, if you take a look at it, and we may well delve into this later because this is, this is worthy of its own study. But Isaiah is a book that's made up of 66 chapters. And those 66 chapters do a really good job of reflecting the 66 books of the Bible. So Isaiah breaks into chapters 1 through 39, which, which uh, largely is about judgment. Uh, and then chapters 40 through 66, largely about hope. Uh, likewise, the Bible breaks into Old Testament and New Testaments at that same division, 39 books and 27 books. 39 chapters, 27 chapters. So, John quotes Isaiah twice to bring evidence as to why it was that Jesus did not garner more popular support even at this late close of his public ministry. And here's how John puts it. In verse 38, John says, This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. Which is to say, 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah prophesied that this would be the way this would go. Quotes Isaiah twice. First he says, Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now that's a quote from Isaiah chapter 53. And Isaiah 53 is known as the song of of the suffering servant. So we're talking about the Messiah. We're, we're talking about the, the suffering servant of God. And the biblical um, way of doing these things, the biblical convention, is in the New Testament, if there's just a verse that is quoted from a passage, it's to bring to mind to us the entire passage. So it's not just the quote. We, we should have in mind the entire passage. So when John quotes Isaiah 53, verse 1, he wants us to be recollecting the entire passage of Isaiah 53, which reads as follows. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment 
he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, we will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's Isaiah chapter 53. That's the passage John is bringing to bear upon this situation of Jesus being so late in the public ministry and yet not having turned the hearts of Israel to follow him. So John continues in verse 39. For this reason they could not believe because as Isaiah says elsewhere, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them. Now, John opens up with a quote from Isaiah 53. John continues with a quote from Isaiah 6. Now, um, I want to say this uh, at this time. So we've got this passage concerning the suffering servant of God. It comes in Isaiah chapter 53. There are certain Bible scholars who describe themselves as um, textual scholars. They describe themselves as uh, adherents to the historico-critical method. Critical Bible scholars. And these critical Bible scholars, as they approach Isaiah, they hypothesize, they posit, they they guess that Isaiah was written by more than one author. So they say that Isaiah was probably written by as many as three different individuals. The first would be responsible in their minds for the writing of Isaiah chapter 1 through 39. And they call this character Proto-Isaiah. Another author, they would say, was responsible for writing Isaiah 40 through 55 or so. Uh, And they would call that that person Deutero-Isaiah. And then a Tridio-Isaiah who would be responsible for the rest of the book. Basically, those historical criticism adherents those particular Bible scholars simply do not believe in the notion of predictive prophecy. Um, And and so they they don't necessarily believe that God could reveal future events to Isaiah and for Isaiah to write them down. Um, Your humble servant, me, (laughs) right? Uh, I'm probably something of a rare duck uh, I, I actually subscribe to the unitary authorship of Isaiah. Uh, I, I believe there is adequate textual evidence that supports the idea that Isaiah as a literary work was the work of one particular author whose name was Isaiah, right? Um, John certainly is treating Isaiah as a, a single author And I think thematically we can see that Isaiah does stick to one particular theme through the entire 66 books. It's not something that that simply is divided up. So, 
John quotes Isaiah in Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant, and John also quotes Isaiah 6. Now, this passage of Isaiah 6 you're probably familiar with. It's the, the passage in which Isaiah has a vision of the Lord high and lifted up in the temple. And you remember the train of, the, the train of God's robe filled the temple. And Isaiah says, look, I'm, I'm undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. And my, my face has seen the Lord. Uh, and, and then, you know, God says, you know, who, who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. And so immediately following that, then God reveals this particular passage, which, which the upshot of which is this. That Isaiah, you're going to go, you're going to, to you know, declare, thus saith the Lord, you're going to go without, with a prophetic word, but the people will not receive the word. So your ministry will show you no return. You, you will not get the satisfaction of proclaiming a prophecy and having the people understand it and get it and turn their ways. But you still have to be faithful. Because this is, this is a proclamation, this is a, a prophecy that's not simply for this time, but it's a prophecy that will find its fulfillment not only in the near term, but in the long term. And in the really long term. And so we're still talking about this now, today, right? So Isaiah 6 verse 10 says, He's blinded their eyes. And harden their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. So, that verse 41, which I think is, is tremendously important here. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory, saw Jesus' importance, saw Jesus' significance. And he spoke about him. Now, what's, what's the significance that John is pointing out that Isaiah had? Isaiah got it. Isaiah saw Jesus' glory and spoke about it. And, and this, this can only be, this only makes sense with a unitary authorship of Isaiah. I'm getting a little excited about this because, um, because, I'm in the minority, and I think I'm right about this. John is referring to Isaiah, and that Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him, because Isaiah understood that the Messiah of John, the, the Messiah of chapter 53, the suffering servant, is the same Messiah of John chapter 6, the, the train of whose robe filled the temple. So we have a high and lifted up glorious God that Isaiah tells us about. And that's one and the same with the suffering servant of God of Isaiah 53. Isaiah saw that. John saw that Isaiah saw that. And John wants us to see that the Jesus of Isaiah 53 is is the same Jesus, the same glory, as we see that the Father has in Isaiah chapter 6. Tremendously important that we grasp that. Because the Jews, the Jewish religious authorities, the Pharisees, the scribes, the chief priests, the rulers of the law, missed it. They didn't put it together. Isaiah put it together. Isaiah put it together, six, excuse me, 700 years before it happened. Isaiah saw Jesus' glory and spoke of it, spoke about him. Now we continue. Verse 42. Yet at the same time, many among the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they'd be put out of the synagogue. Right now, you know, we we can think of a couple of those Jewish religious authorities who did believe in Jesus, 
right? We, we, can, we can think of Nicodemus, who John tells us about in chapter 3. Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night. He was the teacher of Israel, and he has this conversation with Jesus in which Jesus t- tells him, look, you, you must be born again. But then also tells him that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. Joseph of Arimathea as well was also a ruler of the Jews who believed in Jesus. It was Joseph of Arimathea who actually came to Pilate and begged for the body of the crucified Jesus. That it's Joseph of Arimathea who took Jesus down off of the cross. But John goes on, you know, John is saying, look, there were plenty of people whose fear overcame their faith. Right? They were secret disciples. They were incognito disciples because their fear overran their faith. What were they afraid of? They were afraid explicitly, as John tells us, they were afraid of getting kicked out of the synagogue. Now, watch. That, that's a serious thing. To be kicked out of the synagogue meant that you were no longer able to go, go to the temple, no longer able to offer sacrifices, no longer able to be a part of the religious activity of the community, no longer able to be, for example, to be employed or to have commerce with other people who were a part of the synagogue. When you were put out of the synagogue, you were put out of the social, economic, religious, cultural world around you. You were stuck, right? So, Nobody wanted that, so people kind of, well, we're not going to talk about this Jesus thing. Now, that fear of exclusion, that fear of persecution, that fear of being seen as different kept many people's mouths closed about Jesus. But I think John hits the nail on the head in verse 43, where it says, For they loved human praise more than the praise from God. They loved human praise more than the praise from God. You know what? Um, We have to beware of a people-pleasing spirit. And I'll own this, right? I have a people-pleasing spirit. I, I want to be a likable guy. I want people to smile when they're around me. Um, Agreeableness is a personality trait. It's a trait of our personalities. And it's of great advantage in a lot of different settings. You know, it's great to help build a team and those sorts of things. But you know what? It comes at a cost. And we have to be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves, right? Right? So the scripture says, uh, even with our own personalities. And, you know, uh, agreeable folk don't like to upset the status quo. And agreeable folk typically find it very difficult to say no to someone because we want to be agreeable. And many agreeable folk are conflict avoidant which means even when they have an interest in resolving and solving and managing conflicts, still a lot of agreeable people don't want to bring up any topic that might be controversial or might start a conflict, or even to acknowledge a conflict that already exists. Well, at that point, we have to stop and say, how much of my agreeable personality is actually a reflection of a people-pleasing spirit that is eager for the approval of people more so than the approval of God. Because God can call us to some difficult things from time to time. And we see that following Jesus is not always a walk in the park. So this, this particular verse, verse 43, has just uh, given me reason for pause. It's like, wait a minute, 
you know, yeah, I'm pretty easy guy to get along with. Yeah, I'm pretty agreeable. Ooh, wait a minute. There's some things I need to watch out because if this is my personality, and it is, then I need to be able to be aware of the downside of it. And I need to be especially aware that I don't pursue human praise over the praise of God. As Christians, we're to do what we do for an audience of one, which is our Savior. Let's continue in verse 44. Verse 44 begins with the word, then. Then Jesus cried out. Now, I, I want to pause right here, and this is, this is one of those situations of the case of the dog that didn't bark, right? Uh, sometimes you're reading along in the scripture, and usually we're paying attention to what the scripture says, but there comes times we need to be aware of what the scripture does not say. And what the scripture is silent on gives us a little bit more uh, idea of what's really happening. I've pointed this out as we've studied the Gospel of John to this point. I've, I've said on numerous occasions that John gives us time stamps in his Gospel. He tells us when and where certain things are happening. You know, he says, well, it was, you know, the, the, the week before the Passover or the, the, uh, the Feast of the Dedication was going to be in Jerusalem. He gives us all these time markers and also place markers. He's eager to tell us where these things are happening. But then in verse 44, he simply says, then. He, do, he doesn't give us a specific time marker. He gives us a very nonspecific time general time marker. Why is that? Right? Well, um, I think this then is a culmination then. I, I, I think this points us to the beginning of events that will culminate in the crucifixion and resurrection. So verse 44, then Jesus cried out, he cried out. That is, he lifted his voice. He said this so people would be able to hear it. He wanted this to be heard. He cries out for emphasis. And he cries out to express the importance of what he's about to say. And here's what he says. Whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. So what Jesus is saying is that believing in him is believing in the Father. So believing, by the way, I want to say this. Believing is just not a head thing. Believing means that you have ordered your life in such a way as to respond according to the Father's will. That's what belief means. Belief means, by my life, you can tell what, what I think, right? So Jesus says, believing me is believing the Father. Orienting my life around Jesus is the same as orienting my life around the Father. Then he says, seeing Jesus is seeing the Father. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. Wow, that, that, okay, that's a powerful statement. That, that's amazing. And, and how is it we can see the Father? I, I thought that anyone looked upon the Father, you know, you couldn't look upon God and live. Well, part of the miracle of the incarnation is the ability that it gives us to look upon the person of Jesus Christ look upon this member of the Godhead, and live. That's profoundly significant, that, that we can, through the incarnation, look upon God and live. Verse 46, I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. That is, as a light, light reveals. So Jesus comes as a light to reveal the Father. 
Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Right? And we can also take a look in Psalm number 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. So Christ comes to reveal the Father. Christ comes as a lamp, as a light. Now, verses 47 through 50. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the, wor the world, but to save the world. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Now, in this passage, in verse 47 through 50, Jesus is giving us two distinct types of of rejection. There are those who hear, that is, they receive Jesus' words, but they don't keep them. In the Gospel of Matthew, right, those who hear but don't receive, those who hear but don't act on them, are like the person who built their house on sand. When the storm comes, when the flood comes, whoosh, it's all gone. But then there's uh, uh, oh, well, let's, let's stick with this person that hears the words of Jesus, but doesn't keep them. Jesus says he doesn't judge that person because Jesus came to save the world. Je Jesus came as Savior for that person, not as judge. So the words that Jesus spoke are actually the standard by which that person is going to be measured right? So, so the, the words are the judgment, not Jesus. Jesus came to save. You don't want to be saved while the words are left over there, and they'll be the standard by which you're measured. Judgment, by the way, means measurement. Secondly, second type of rejection that we see in verse 48, there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. So, so Jesus is making it clear. There's two different types of rejection here. You can hear me and say, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I should love, uh, I, sh I should do uh, unto others as I would have others do unto me. I should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You, you hear the words, but you don't do them. You can say, yeah, that's right, but you don't apply it to your life. The second rejection is those who don't receive the words at all. They say, oh, yeah, that's all just so much rubbish. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, don't, I don't even intellectually accept the, the value of what Jesus is saying. Jesus says, oh, okay, that now, hey, look, there, there's, there, there's judgment for those who do not accept Jesus' words and reject Jesus as well. So look, looking, at these, looking at these closing verses, Jesus is saying, look, whoever believes in me, you believe in the Father. Whoever looks at me is actually seeing the Father. And then finally, he says that whoever hears me is hearing the Father. I did not speak this on my own, what the Father commands. That is what I have spoken. And look at verse 50. I know that his command leads to eternal life. Now, here, I, I'm afraid we need to make a little bit of a correction in the New International Version's translation. The, the literal Greek, Ken's translation of the literal Greek is this. I know that his command is eternal life. I know that his command is eternal life. It's not that the command leads to eternal life. God's command is eternal life. Now, now that's, that's hugely, hugely different, right? Um, 
to, to say that God's command leads to eternal life might make us think that, you know, that it's a winding path and you might fall off, you might get back on and so on and so forth, uh, that it leads to eternal life. That's not what John is saying. I know that his command is eternal life, is how the Greek text reads. Well, what does that mean? It means, get this, eternal life is God's command. God commands us. God directs us. It is an imperative. God says eternal life is what you're supposed to do. Now, if you reject God's command, your rebellion is against eternal life. You're choosing to rebel against life. So, to reject God's command is to reject eternal life. Wow, that's a, that's a sobering thought right there. My goodness. Well, it, it leads me to, to, to a couple of takeaways. And, and, and the first big takeaway, we're, we're talking about those who reject the gospel, right? How is it that so close to the completion of Jesus' life, how is it that there were so many who rejected the gospel? And John is trying to give us an explanation of that. He's laying it out that, well, look, Isaiah prophesied this. And I understand that Isaiah prophesied it, but wow, you know, um, Something that we need to understand is that for everybody, there's going to be a last time you hear the gospel, right? There's, there's, there's going to be a last time. Now, I can't tell you when that time is going to be. I can't tell you when the last time is going to be the last time. So how do you know it's the last time? You don't. So it, it behooves us. It's to our advantage that in the light of that knowledge, we should reasonably, I mean, it makes good sense to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I, I think that John wrote everything that he wrote that we might believe and by believing that we might have eternal life. So I, I would not be among those who would reject God's command. God's command is have eternal life. How do I do that? Following Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Well, let's have a word of prayer together just now. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for eternal life, which is not only your gift, but it is your command that we have. And we know that the source of eternal life is in Christ Jesus. So we pray for each and every heart that's within the hearing of my words this day, that their hearts would be receptive and open Lord, if there are those who, who may never have accepted you as Lord and Savior, we pray that they would do that even now upon the hearing of these words to open their spirit, their soul, their life to your invitation for eternal life. We give you all thanks and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, once again, from St. Stephen Church in Louisville, Kentucky, this has been the Generations Bible Study. My name is Ken Jobst. It's been a great blessing to be with you. Come back again for our next installment as we continue to study the Gospel of John. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.